I want to welcome everyone to this webinar entitled, Are You Keeping Up to Date? New Law Concerning Opioid Prescribing in Missouri. My name is Brian Oglander. I'm a diplomat with the American Board of Oral Surgery, and we are with Southwest Oral Surgery Dental Implants. This is part of Southwest Oral Surgery's Education at Your Fingertips Continuing Education. We are a PACE-approved provider through the Academy of General Dentistry. Today we're looking at a new law that came out in July of 2019, passed by the legislature in Missouri, and our objectives in learning about this new law are to review the new legislation and how it affects opioid prescribing, discuss what is meant by morphine milligram equivalents, and introduce the concept of e-prescribing or electronic prescribing. I have no disclosures with this presentation. So for those of you who don't know, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs has a pretty neat little website, and on the website they'll update new happenings and legislation that affects prescribers in dentistry, medicine, according to uh, opioids and how they are dispensed. And these updates usually come out maybe twice, three times a year. And we're going to highlight an update from the summer of 2019. But if you go to their website, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, bndd.com, you'll find under what's new something like this. And you can read about some publications and learn a little bit. Um, it's a pretty good informative website if you never check it out. You'll pick up little tidbits and make sure you're on the right track when you prescribe any controlled substances for your patients. So we're going to look at a new law, July 11th, 2019. Governor Parson signed a Senate Bill 514 into law. This law went into effect on August 28th, 2019. Again, this update is from the publication by the BNDD in their summer 2019 updates. And three key points from the new law. Long-acting and extended release opioid preparations shall not be used for acute pain and majority of dentists aren't using long-acting or extended-release opioids, but this is a new change. They are not to be used for acute pain. And if the dentist felt that a slow-release or long-acting opioid was needed, you need to make sure in the patient's record you're documenting your justification for why you feel this medication is necessary. Uh, that's in addition to the drug, dosage, quantity, the instructions for taking that, and uh, refills. The second key point from the law is the dentist shall avoid prescribing opioid regimens greater than 50 milligram morphine equivalents per day for treatment of acute pain. We're going to discuss what that means. And if you're going to go over this 50 uh, morphine milligram equivalents, you must have justification or reason on the chart for why. And then we'll also review electronic prescriptions for opioids. So back to that first key point in the legislation. So what is a long-acting opioid? These are extended release preparations and they avoid the up and downs of breakthrough pain encountered with your shorter acting opioid pain medication. So a lot of times you give a patient an opioid, you're going to reach your peak effect at about 30, 45 minutes, and you may get a duration of about two, three hours from that pain relief. Um, the opioids that are long acting are trying to avoid this breakthrough pain that happens and provide extended pain relief uh, throughout the duration of the medication. A very common one is OxyContin, um, and that is basically oxycodone, 10 milligrams, but it's extended release, and so it's only um, dispensed to be given every 12 hours. The indications for long-acting opioids, chronic pain syndromes, people with neuropathic pain or those with terminal disease, example, cancer with bone invasion. Some pretty debilitating medical conditions require long-acting opioids. Acute uh, management for dental pain, acute procedures that we may be doing as dentists in our office usually are not indicated for long-acting opioids. Uh, and to note, in the above situations, long-acting opioids provide sustained pain relief with less periods of breakthrough pain. Again, most, if not all, dental procedures fall under the short-duration pain category. Uh, and in dentistry, if you're doing any surgeries, you probably have found already that a majority of the patients tolerate very well just taking ibuprofen or over-the-counter Motrin, Advil. Ibuprofen is not only a pain reliever, not only a fever reducer, but also its most beneficial effect too, which is anti-inflammation. 
Remember, patients need to be instructed if they're going to take Motrin or ibuprofen to be taking 600 milligrams or three tablets. Each tablet's 200 milligrams, um, and you take that every six hours. And in order to get that inflammatory, anti-inflammatory effect, they need to be on it around the clock. So 600 milligrams around the clock every six hours, at least three to five days. Motrin's rapidly absorbed. It has a great peak serum level at about one and a half to two hours. You can also add acetaminophen for some of these breakthrough pains. Uh, some prescribers will have patients take Motrin or ibuprofen along with acetaminophen or Tylenol. Both of those drugs are synergistic and you tend to see a greater pain relief because they are synergistic and act together. What is a morphine milligram equivalent? So we're back now to the second phase of this law and this is more applicable to what we should be aware of as providers. A, mil a morphine milligram equivalent is a value assigned to opioids to represent their relative potencies. And morphine milligram equivalent is determined by using an equivalency factor. We'll see what these factors are to calculate a dose of morphine that is equivalent to the ordered opioid. And that's a little bit confusing. We'll look and it'll make more sense as we go along. And you can take morphine milligram equivalents for one particular drug, whether it's hydrocodone or oxycodone, and you can add that to any other narcotics that a patient may be taking, and you can come up with a milligram equivalent dosing. A medical equivalent dosing, MED, is the sum of any of the morphine milligram equivalents of all opioids a patient is likely to take within 24 hours. When you add all these total doses up, you'll determine um, a total milligram equivalent dosing and that gives you an idea of how much narcotics the patient's taking and are they reaching a potentially dangerous threshold. Morphine equivalent dosing determines a patient's cumulative intake of any of the drugs in the opioid class over 24 hours. The primary side effects of opioid overdose is respiratory depression. That leads to serious complications, death, these are things we don't want. We want to be aware of these morphine milligram equivalents and their dosing and this is the reason why the board has included this when we prescribe. So when you look at the dose of 50 milligram morphine equivalents per day, dosages at or above 50 MME per day increase the risk for overdose by about two times. If you keep your amount and dosages of opioids at around the 20 milligram per morphine milligram equivalent per day, less chance for respiratory depression, less chance that your patient is going to have untoward reactions with the opioid medication. In one particular study, patients were prescribed higher dosages of opioids um, and they had a higher risk of opioid death. So in a national sample of Veterans Health Administration patients with chronic pain receiving opioids, and this was in the duration of 2004 to 2009, five-year span, patients who died of opioid overdose were prescribed an average of 98 morphine milligram equivalents per day, while other patients were prescribed an average of 48. So some of the reason why this dosage cutoff was developed is because they noticed patients who were taking opioid amounts greater than 50 morphine milligram equivalents per day had a greater likelihood for respiratory depression and untoward effects from the opioids. So how do we calculate what is known as morphine milligram equivalents so we know exactly what we're giving as a script to a patient and making sure that we're under this 50 um, MME level. Well, first we determine the total daily amount of each opioid we are prescribing the patient. So the total daily amount of the opioid the patient's taking, we convert that to a morphine milligram equivalent by using a conversion factor we'll see in the table and adding all these um, dosages together to arrive at our MME tally. So calculating morphine milligram equivalents, we need to know what a conversion factor is. And if you look at this table, really the only two drugs you're going to need to keep in mind, and it's very simple, as dentists we use hydrocodone very often in our preparations like Vicodin, Norco, or we may use oxycodone as a pain reliever, a common uh, in Percocet. And you'll see that the conversion factor for hydrocodone is 1%. And you'll see that the conversion factor for oxycodone is one and a half. And we'll see how this comes into play when we're calculating our dosage. So let's look at this example. Remember, morphine milligram equivalent is the total dose possible of an opioid times its equivalency factor in a 24-hour 
time period. So let's take a look at one prescription. Let's say a dentist writes a prescription for a patient, and that prescription is for the patient to take hydrocodone and a strength of 5 milligrams of hydrocodone and 325 milligrams of Tylenol or APAP. The dentist gives the instructions one to two tabs of this 5 milligram 325 combination to be taken every four hours for pain. So if we want to calculate what our MME dose for this is, we see that if the patient can take one to two tabs every four hours, that the patient would be taking 10 milligrams of hydrocodone. If they take the maximum, so two tabs. If they're taking it every four hours, which our instructions in this particular script allow, then they can take that six times a day or every four hours, and they get a dosage total potential of 60 milligrams of hydrocodone. And if we take that 60 milligrams of hydrocodone and we multiply it by our equivalency factor of 1, we see that we are allowing this patient to have 60 morphine milligram equivalents per day, and so that's a little bit over. So you'll notice that when you write your scripts, you don't want to give um, patients the leeway of taking a prescription every 4 to 6 hours or every 4 hours. You probably want to stick with the every 6 hours, and we'll see that here. Let's look at the Rx uh, down below here where it says Rx2, a better way to prescribe for acute pain, dental setting, one tab of hydrocodone, 7.5 milligrams, and 325 milligrams of Tylenol every six hours. So we're not allowing two tablets, we're only allowing one. We did increase the dosage by a little bit, but we're only allowing it every six hours. Now we want to calculate first the total dose of the opiate per day. So they're allowed one 7.5 milligram tablet every six hours, so only four times a day. That'll leaves us with 30 milligrams of hydrocodone total per day times the equivalency factor of one, that's 30 MME, and now we're below the 50 morphine milligram equivalents. And now you understand why this rule came about, and what it does is it keeps patients out of trouble. It decreases the amount of narcotic, and really, truly with Motrin, Tylenol, and some of the things that we're doing, they don't need high dosage of narcotics anyway. Uh, the Bureau of Narcotics and Danger Dangerous Drugs points out that the prescribing authority of dentists with this rule has not been restricted, and a dentist may continue to prescribe with the full authority that they have in the past. We're just trying to limit the amount that the patient is giving to a particular level. Uh, we also want to highlight from this new legislation that passed, there is uh, an electronic prescription required for controlled substances ruling. And what this means is, rather than giving the patient a script for their pain medication that they take to Walgreens, CVS, whatever, um, actually requiring the dentist to go online and use an e-prescribing program and through a secure link, linking with the patient's pharmacy and prescribing via a secure link. This way, patients can't alter prescriptions. There is a record of each script that was given, when it was given. Um, the pharmacy has clear records and has the patient's information as well as clear dated information. No worry about um, the prescriber having poor handwriting, having to call, check, things of this nature. So let's read through this new legislation, mandatory electronic prescriptions for all controlled substances. Again, uh, the law went into effect in August 28, 2019. And the new language requires all prescriptions for controlled substances to be electronic by January 2021. So we're talking about within another year, this law basically requires all prescriptions for narcotics to be in electronic form. Now we're going to see that this may be um, altered a little bit. This gives an individual practitioner in pharmacies approximately a two-year window to research and implement the electronic prescribing of controlled substances, or what the DEA refers to as EPCS. The Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs does not have any additional requirements and mirrors the DEA federal regulations. Practitioners are advised to ensure that any software or hardware they are implementing comes with a source where their system has been audited and approved by the DEA. And so what this means, whatever operating system you may be using in your office to run your uh, dental programs to keep track of patients and charting and things of this nature. There are third-party providers that link up with that and they have to be approved by the DEA, their programs which are um, utilized for electronic prescribing. Companies offering EPCS should be uh, able to show you their DEA authorization. That's going to be important. Although the new law requires EPCS in Missouri by January 2021, the law contains nine sections of exceptions where practitioners may continue to prescribe in writing, telephone, or fax. 
One of these exceptions is that the practitioner may ask for an annual waiver from the BNDD in certain circumstances. I have tried to find out what these certain circumstances may be. I've tried to find the nine uh, exceptions or waivers that are included in this bill unsuccessfully. So at this point, whether this is fully going to be implemented in 2021 is really um, not for sure. And I have no idea what these other waivers are, but the key is to be staying up to date and looking at the BNDD's website and not being uneducated so that this doesn't spring up and become a bigger issue for providers. Um, any waivers that would be distributed are valid for one year, apparently. The BNDD uh, is to establish a process by regulation. At this time, the department is researching the new law and determining the best way to implement it. So there may be differences in how this rollout happens. Maybe by 2021, they'll have given dentists certain waivers and allow extensions. But at this point in time, you can't be sure exactly how they're going to implement this law. But this is something that's coming out and it's something you want to keep aware of. So I hope that helps you guys with some of the new information out there in regards to the new law that was passed in, in July 2019 concerning opioids. And this is just the first presentation that we're going to have in regards to opioids and pain management. Look for other presentations that are going to be available, and we'll send out emails for these. And I hope you enjoyed this one. And thanks again for your time.